my own life had I'd run out of road and I wasn't even aware of it. It was as if I was, you know, I was living in a big house, but I decided to just stay in the kitchen and paper over all the other doors. What I was missing was, was wholeness because I wasn't allowing those parts of myself to speak. The story that I was telling myself, everything I was creating was coming from fear of abandonment in some way. What I was wasting in a way was the potential to run my own company to support people who were also trying to find their own paths in life. Okay, Fiona, welcome to the show. Um, so you've just published or you're about to publish a book called um, Find Your Own Path. And I'm just curious, you know, maybe a good place to start here would be to ask you how you find your own path. Mm, thank you. Um, when I started to write the book, the, the cursor was kind of blinking at me rather intimidatingly. And like any writer, I got writer's block. <laughs> instantly so I thought you know what I'll just start telling a story about my own life and maybe that'll be something that won't make it into the final cut maybe it will but actually as I wrote it I thought this is actually I hope quite a useful service um partly in case anyone imagines that coaches have got their lives all sorted out <laughs> um but also to understand the power of the story that we tell ourselves so the power of the story that I'm telling you is one that I can only tell now, really. Um, so about 12 years ago, I was, in every way you might say, a um, nominally successful person. I had a good job. I was the MD of a publishing company. Um, I had a good social life was living in a, a hippest place in the hippest town. And, and um, I woke up one morning and you know how you get those first two seconds, three seconds of pre-consciousness and then consciousness arrives. And I just, I, I couldn't get out of bed. Um, I was completely polaxed by panic attacks. I'd never had a panic attack before. This had come out of the blue. I didn't know what it was, what was happening. There wasn't a reason um, that I could think of. And the way I understand that now, looking back at myself 12 years ago, that what I didn't know then, because it was very frightening, was that this was an alarm bell ringing mm. of my own life. Um, my own life had I'd run out of road, and I wasn't even aware of it. Um, the metaphor that I use in the book was, it was as if I was, you know, I was living in a big house, but I decided to just stay in the kitchen and paper over all the other doors. Mm. And there might be pipes clanking in a different part of the room of the house. There might be a knocking at the door, but I've just turned the music up and kept working and kept taking care of other people and going out and having this amazing life. Um, but eventually the knocking at the door became so loud that I had to go and answer it. And when I did, um, there was a part of myself saying, why won't you let me speak? And why won't you take mm. care of me? That began uh, a journey for me into what it was that needed to speak. Um, it was a, a long, slow journey, first into therapy to understand what was going on. And I realized ultimately that what was happening was that I was coming up to the same age that my mother had been when she'd passed away, which is a really big moment for people, um, psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, and very often brings up a huge amount of, of unconscious material. Mm. So I got myself into therapy and I realized that the experience of losing my mom at an early age, and I, I was then adopted had left me, um, in order to be successfully adopted, I had to suppress a part of myself. Okay. And I had learned to adapt and be successful in the world, which is what we all do in the first part of our lives, right? We all learn to be how to successful in the world, how to belong, how to get on with people, how to not just survive, but, but thrive by many of the metrics that a lot of people um, 
uh, use and that our culture uses for us. You know, I bought a house and I got a good job and I had a black MX, MX card and all the rest of it. Um, but what I was missing was, was wholeness because I wasn't allowing those parts of myself to speak. And once I had got in contact with that, realized what the issues were and realized that the story that I was telling myself, everything I was creating was coming from fear of abandonment in some way. Um, I needed to go back and rewrite it a bit, look at it again. From that base, I then moved into self-development because I realized that what I was wasting in a way was the potential to run my own company um, to support people who were also trying to find their own paths in life. Mm. But I had a good help. I had a hand with that. I had a life coach who was amazing. Um, and that really helped me. And as of course, I've become a life coach and a leadership coach and a facilitator and now an author. One of the things that really sticks in my craw about our industry is it's quite difficult to get coaching unless you have the readies, right? It's, it's, not a, it's not a cheap thing to do all the time. It can be very cost effective. It's a good investment. And I realized that I was only able to help so many people. So I wrote the book because although not everyone can afford a coach, they can at least get something, hopefully, from a book. So the book really is, is another step on my path, if you like. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, as I always say, that the, the path isn't always about um, uh, happiness. What it is, is about being authentic, you know, letting your whole self speak even the parts that are going to be troublesome at times or you don't want to listen to sometimes. Um, but stay in mastery of them. You know, mm. stay in some kind of keep your own hands on the wheel in order to create a life that's meaningful. Because one of the things that I've learned, and I, I offer it to people in the book through coaching and facilitating, gosh, probably thousands of people now with the amount of talks and workshops that I've done, is that what people, when they come to seek their own path, are looking for might not be a new job or a new relationship or a promotion or more money or a business launch or a what they're actually looking for is meaning in their lives. So that's yes. what your path actually means. There should be a kind of line underneath your path. Um, so that we, in order to do that, we need to stop following those internal scripts that we have about what we should do. So that's basically the story. In an, it's, it's a very big nutshell of, of how I moved from, from where I was to where I am now. And it gives me some guidance to where I'm going next. What I see is the kind of purpose of my life. Amazing, amazing. Well, I could certainly, you know, you said there about in writing this book, you've aimed to make, I suppose, coaching more accessible. And that's kind of what it felt like as I was moving through the book. You know, it feels like you're almost being coached as you read the book, you know, so that's fantastic. So I want to commend you on that. Thank Something you. I'm curious to ask you about in the preface of the book, you talk about um, at one point in your life, you were, you were longing to find your, your mother's burial site. Mm -hmm. And, and then a bit of a miracle happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious, can you maybe tell us a bit more about that? And also what do you think that says about the, about the world we live in that that happened? I'm just curious to get your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Wow. What a question. And, and thank you for asking it. Um, I realized that there was one place in the world that I couldn't go. Even with all the, the, the therapy, I was still not going to this one place. You know, I traveled all over the world, but I'd never gone to this place in Ireland where my mother is buried. Mm. And I tried to find it. And amazingly, the internet doesn't give you all the answers you want, especially where people, sometimes where people are buried. Um, and I thought the only way that I can do this maybe is maybe I go to Ireland and I roughly know the area. Maybe I go to the churches, check in church records, walk through graveyards. Um, and what I did for a long time was I pretended that I didn't care. Well, it's not important then, I, I, you know. But it was only when I said to myself, no, I really want to do this. There's a part of me that needs 
mm. something there. I didn't even know what it was. When I actually decided I was going to ask for it and really go for it, which meant, of course, exposing myself to potential disappointment. Can you imagine, you know, looking for your mum and not being able to find it? I mean, the, the frustration, it was like losing her again. Mm. Um, and I looked and I searched and I couldn't find anything. I tried different avenues. You know, a friend of mine who's a journalist said, look, we can find someone who's a researcher for you. And But then pretty much when I'd given up hope and my heart was kind of broken again with this frustration, I literally one evening was sitting and on Facebook, a little message popped up that said, hello, I think we might be related. Is this your birthday? And I couldn't believe it. I, I, I really, it, it astounded me. And I'm still not sure how to explain it other than to say that I do think that the world is, is bigger than we know. I think, and it, it, for some people, it sounds quite hippie-ish or woo-woo. But here is something that says to me that there is mystery, that somehow this didn't come to me until I really wanted it. And the story from the other side is, and this is an interesting one, was that I didn't know if, I never thought of connect, you know, I'd never thought of finding her family because I didn't know if they knew about me. You know, I was born in the late sixties in Ireland, illegitimate. It was a very, not a great situation for a, a, a young mother to be in. Um, and I didn't know if her family knew about me and I didn't want to rock the boat. Mm. And the truth is, is that they had known about me. And they didn't want to rock my boat in case I didn't know. Wow. But the story was that this is, this, is, this is my generation. You know, people in their 40s and 50s, oh, it's best not. She might not know. Don't want to upset her. Don't know who she is. But, and they were looking. And one of their kids who was 20 was going, don't be ridiculous. Let's see if we can find her on Facebook. <laughs> you know, with that mm. kind of, that sort of... Um, uh, um, innocence, naivety, and enthusiasm that doesn't necessarily think about what consequences might be. And sometimes that's a good thing, right? And they were looking at people on the internet and they were going, do you think it's her? Do you think she looks like one of us? And, and then they said, well, it, it could be her. Let's ask. And they were like, no, 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 no. And she went, oh, I'll just, I'll just diddle at her <laughs> before they knew it, she did send. And that was the message. So not only did I meet my mum, but I met my family. And not only that, but I'd never had anything of my mum's apart from one photograph that I hadn't been able to see her very clearly in. And they mm. had tons of photographs. They even had kept, and they'd kept everything, all of her letters, all of her cards, her photographs. They had kept my christening robe as well, as if, you know, hoping that maybe one day they'd be able to give it to me. All of this was there and people who could tell me about the family and my grandparents and my uncles and my aunts and this country, you know? Um, so it, it, it was a gift and a blessing in a way that I'm, wasn't transactional. I think the idea of you manifest things can become very transactional, but mm. was somehow grace, was mm. somehow a blessing in some way. And, and I feel humble towards it because mm. I can't explain what it was, but I believe that it was something that was grace. Wow. Mm. That's, that's an incredible story. And I can't imagine how, how meaningful an experience that actually was for you, Fiona. That must have been just incredible, you know. So yeah. I'm really glad you got to have that. Um, yeah, thank you. The, the next question I'd like to sort of move towards now would be, what does it actually mean to find your own path? And for someone that's listening to this, that's, you know, they're relatively content, they're working a job that's okay, and they're just sort of, I suppose, going through the motions. Um, why is it important that people find their own path? And what are the benefits of, of, um, of doing this, of going down this, this journey? I think it's a, a, a complicated question. And I don't want to rock the boat of somebody who goes, my brother um, says to me, 
and he's a great leveler. He says, why do people want coaches? Why can't people just get up in the morning, go to work, come back, go to the gym, have some food, watch telly, go to bed, you know? Um, and there's nothing wrong with that or any of the things that people do. But as I say in the book, for a lot of people, for a lot of reasons, there might be a call at some point. It could be that they're naturally maturing so that they're the lives that they set up in their 20s, 30s maybe, aren't quite in alignment with who they are now. And that can show up as restlessness, frustration, emptiness, sometimes even anxiety and depression as well, or even panic attacks, anxiety attacks like I was having. Um, you can also be thrown out of a life that once you felt quite meaningful. One of the people that I talked to in the book is an ex-military officer. And there were lots of people in her um, uh, when she was you know, working there or, or involved there who once their commission ended or once they ended their sort of, you know, period of service, suddenly found themselves feeling very lost. Mm. And of course, systems don't always reward people. Um, and they feel they have that question of, OK, what do I do now? You know, mm. I thought I'd get the promotion or I thought I'd get this opportunity, now what? And psychologists have said a few things about what might be useful to think of next. Because I think when you reach that, crash, that threshold, you have a choice. You can numb the pain or the fill, try and fill the emptiness. You can... Pretend that nothing, that everything's okay and just continue. Um, you can try and seek external um, sources of happiness or joy or pleasure or avoidance of pain in your life. Mm. But actually, the search for a more meaningful, authentic one has several benefits, according to psychologists. And the people who do a lot of work on this are people like Ray Baumeister, um, and other ones who've looked at the difference between happiness and meaning. Mm. The searches for happiness tend to exclude challenge. They tend to exclude growth. They can be fleeting. And once the happiness has worn off, they can, you, you, we, we tend to return um, to a base level of wherever we were. We think of people who win the lottery and then after a few months or a couple of years, they return to their base level of contentment. Um, the search for meaning, on the other hand, includes challenge, encompasses uncomfortable feelings and struggle. And there are some benefits to this. And by the way, of course, meaning isn't separate from happiness, but Happiness is the kind of some of the outcomes, one of the outcomes. Mm. But when we, when, and this is also followed by quite a lot of psychological research, when people look for meaning in their lives and they think, I want a meaningful life, one that is my path rather than following a script or chasing fleeting happiness, then validation arises from within rather than relies mm. on it coming from without. Um, struggles are seen as part of the journey rather than a sign that you shouldn't be doing this. Mm. So we're able to face challenges. We're able to lean in to uncomfortable feelings. And there's a huge amount of growing psychological evidence about not indulging or parking ourselves there, but actually allowing ourselves to feel the discomfort in order to understand what might be needed from us. And the final thing that I would say about it is, is that if you like looking for meaning in your life, gives you that what Nietzsche said, he who, can, um, who has a why can bear any how. It gives us greater resilience. Um, and ultimately, I would say, connects us to our shared humanity as well. We can be much more tolerant of other people. From a coaching perspective, it's really useful because when we 
search for our own path, what we see is that our, our past connects to our present and leads to our future, rather than seeing life as a series of random events that just happen to us. So there's more of a sense of agency. Um, and that's really important from a coaching perspective. We want to increase people's locus of control so that they mm -hmm. feel that they have um, some impact, whether they are CEOs of companies, whether they're people starting their own, whether people just wanting to change their lives in any aspect at all, it doesn't really matter. But having a sense of self-efficacy is incredibly important. And I think the, the idea of life as a journey in which we have our hands on the wheel and can steer it the way that we want to go is really important. And we can only do that when we understand what's going to make that life meaningful for us by using compass and a lot of the coaching tools that I use in the book. 100%. That's very well said. And just that last metaphor you used there about, you know, this, this idea of life being a journey. Um, I think, you know, I, I really do buy into that, but at the same time, there's also, you mentioned this in your weekend university talk, actually, there's a, there's a bit from Alan Watts, the philosopher, and he talks about, um, you know, we, we thought of life as a, as an analogy, as a, as a journey, you know, a serious, a serious thing with a purpose that we had to get to at the end, you know, which causes us to like always postpone our enjoyment. And he, what he says is, um, actually life is a, it's more of a musical thing and we're supposed to sing or to dance as the music is being played. And I find this big conflict in myself between, you know, is it this really serious thing or is this something we're supposed to really just enjoy as, as it unfolds, you know? So what are your, what are your thoughts on that, on those two different metaphors there? I think, I think it's, I think it's profound. Um, what, what was talking about, if you like, is, is the way that our culture always puts the next thing in front of us that we want to have. Like, mm. here, kitty, kitty, like, keep going, mm. kindergarten, school, college, you know. And that that's a track that's laid up for us. You know, you, you buy something from a shop or from an online store, and the next thing they're sending you <laughs> all the other things that you should buy, you know. And that makes sense. That's how capitalism works. But there's always more. There's always the next thing. Keep coming, keep coming. Finding your own path isn't quite like that you know maybe mm. i should have written you know like find your own disco <laughs> <laughs> dance to the music as you go along. that's the next one so it's understanding what it is authentically to you so that so that you don't get you, you don't have to follow the hit the little breadcrumb trail up the stairs of the you know the corporate job into the corner office or whatever it might be if that's part of your purpose remembering that that's a vehicle for your purpose it's not the thing itself Getting qualifications mm. is the vehicle, not the thing itself, says the woman with three degrees. <laughs> took me a while to figure out that one. But I was having a great time doing it. I was having a great time doing it because I loved learning. Mm. I loved learning and I loved the challenges that it was giving me and the people that I met and the places that I traveled. So that actually felt pretty purposeful to me. Um, I'm using it as an example now because let's put my own skin in the game, right? Um, uh, if I had listened to my dad, I would have done law and be a barrister. I would have been good at that, he says. <laughs> I'm not sure I would have lasted one semester. But I chose to do the things that, that my heart was connected to. I chose to dance my purpose because what I was doing, my research, my first research, you probably know this, was on... Um, at clubs in New York and talking to people about how going to clubs was meaningful for them. You know, mm. it created community and identity and all of these other things that were incredibly important. So I find that the, the idea of a separation of these things is, is I, think it, I think it's a cultural, I think it's, you know, I, I suspect, and I don't know what you think, it's the internalization of a cultural idea that you can be serious and make things and have purpose, or you can have fun, dance, play. And I think that's a misunderstanding of what purpose is as well, which mm. I say in the book, it's not this lofty achieving thing. That is for some people. But if it's not for you, then that doesn't mean that your life doesn't have purpose. You know, it is about aligning yourself, understanding as well that, you know, I suppose for me, 
you know, my beliefs are that this is this is this is the the, the go around that I've got of life. You know, and if there are other lives, I'm not really conscious of them myself, though I do respect that other people think differently and believe differently. So what are we going to do with it in a way that we can at the end go, yeah, I did my I did my best and I, I brought my gifts into the world. I brought mm. my gifts into the world and I danced with them and with the world um, in a way that brought those into, um, it, you know, potentially into making the world a better place. And, and when I say that, that's not something that you necessarily do from the corner office. You might do, but you might do it just in the person that you are in life, mm. you know, the way that you treat people, the way that you ask somebody else to dance with you. You know, the way that you thank the musicians, the way that you, you know, um, learn how to play the fiddle yourself so people can dance and, and enjoy, enjoy themselves too. Um, what matters is that it's, it's authentic to you rather than something that you feel that you should do. Mm. That's, that's the key part of it. I think that was one of the coolest things I took from the book was this idea that, you know, purpose and a meaningful life isn't a lofty thing, isn't a grandiose thing. Like if you're clear on what that is for you, you can find ways to express that in everyday life that aren't grandiose, but are still going to provide you with a huge sense of meaning as you move throughout throughout your day, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And yet, of course, our culture in many ways reifies risk takers and the big lofty stuff. And I've worked a lot with corporates and organizations around purpose. And what they tend to think initially is that it, it, it's about drafting a big mission statement with mm. big words in it. Um, and actually, it's, it's, about, it's about the whole culture of an organization. It's how we behave towards each other. It's what we're doing this for. And how we influence the ecosystem and all stakeholders of what we're doing it for, including people we might never meet, you know, what we're modeling. Because certainly at work, you know, work is, work is a school for life, you know, yeah. and people have a really good opportunity to, to learn about that. So if people think in a corporate level that it's the leadership team, the C-suite who decide what purpose is and how it's enacted, and if we in our everyday lives think that purpose is enacted by the Greta Thunbergs or the Steve Jobs or the Prince Charles's of the world who, who seems to have a sense of purpose, partly obviously inherited, but also partly because what he's decided to use his, you know, um, the gifts and the privileges that he has to do. Um, but that doesn't mean that the rest of us should feel that our life is without purpose in any way. If we're, if we're not here to create an app that changes the world or cure cancer or write that great novel, um, what it is is that it becomes what's purposeful for us. It doesn't need the rubber stamp of anybody else. Um, you know, here, what you're doing, you know, is incredibly purposeful to you. And it shows. It shows in what you're doing. You know, you're doing your bit. You're doing something that brings your skills in. Um, and it shows because people want to work with you. You know, I want, you know, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to chat with you and other people are too. And that breeds success. And there will be challenge in that. And maybe you, at a certain point, you might say, well, actually, I want to change what I'm doing. This is the, again, vehicle for your purpose rather than the purpose in and of itself. And there'll be other things that you'll do too. A hundred percent. You know, I find in my own, my own experience, whatever way my particular um, universe is is, uh, rigged, if I ever act out of alignment with what is really important to me, um, I get instant feedback that, no, this isn't going to work. You have to try something else, you know? What does that feedback look like? I think it's useful for people to recognize. For me, it's it's usually a combination of of a gut feeling um, that I just know this this isn't right. And literally feedback, just things won't work, you know, projects I try and start with, they just won't work, you know, whereas if I'm fully in there, like it seems things seem to happen of their own accord almost, you know, mm-hmm. but you mentioned there a few about changes and, you know, um, something I, I'm really curious to ask is 
a big part of change is, is letting go of old identities we might have had in the past. And how do you how do you help your clients, the people you work with, transition and let go of these identities and move into a new space, a new new identity in their life? Yeah, it, it's a it's a powerful question. And I think it helps to start to put it in a context, first of all, of understanding what change is. Change is a process. There's not a click, whish, off you go. And the process is, first of all, initiation. And that can be internal or external. And then separation, as you say. And then once you do that, you go into the transition. Once you come through that, you're into incorporation, which is when you embody it and it, it becomes your new normal, right? So it's useful to say that to people watching or listening because understanding that it is a process allows you to map where you are on it and what to expect. And what happens in separation is that because, and, and this isn't just um, emotionally or psychologically, this is, you know, the, the neuroscience bears this out. We have um, most of what we do with our brains is, is, is hold a status quo. If you think a huge amount of energy in our body is, is taken just to keep our body temperature level, a huge amount of energy is just to do that. And our brain works a lot at, at trying to avoid us from thinking. Funnily enough, <laughs> for an organ that's associated with thought, right? But the problem with thinking is that it's very, very energy intensive. So the brain is absolutely fantastic at uploading things to habit, so much so that we don't even see it. And I'll give you an example in a small way of how I help a client. So let's say I'm sitting with a client. I've also asked them permission. Do I, you know, if I notice things, can I interrupt you and say something? And let's imagine that this client tells me what their issue is. Or let's say that they've had a little action plan and they've come back and they've not done it. Um, or, and they start to say, oh, I know I'm a bit I'm pathetic. And they're saying it almost as an, a kind of aside and they're not even noticing how they're talking to themselves. And I'll say, can we slow down a little bit more? There's, you know, what's going on? What's happening? And what's happened is that an inner critic has got in the room. And there are lots of inner critics and also saboteurs as well. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep you in from separating from your old life because of various reasons. One is because of the fear of rejection, um, of pain, of shame, uh, fear of failure, fear of the unknown, fear of loss, all of these things that psychologists have shown we're actually more motivated by than hope of gain, um, which is quite terrifying. So we have to kind of get over that. And we have these built-in mechanisms that will try and keep us in the safety zone to prevent that. Um, it's my job as a coach to work with people to get them over that. And there are several ways to do that. One is the inner critic. We have to tackle the inner critics and the saboteurs. And the saboteurs, the inner critics, I make a distinction between inner critics that say, you're pathetic, you'll never be able to do this. And the saboteurs that say, oh, this is really hard, isn't it? And, you know, you, you, you really, it's not fair that you have to do this. It's way too hard. It's way too big. They infantilize you and disempower you. And you have to work with that as well. You have to notice when they come up. Um, and that's not the same as knowing that you need a rest, by the way. <laughs> right? If we need to make a distinction about that later. Other things that are really important are to change your state. A lot of us are, are currently we remain in a fairly similar state. You know, we're sitting here, I'm sitting at my desk where I've sat for most of the day doing calls and I also did writing and I also did some other stuff as well, all at my desk, you know, on my computer. I was, talk, you know, talking to a friend, talking to a client, writing something, and I'm very, very static and my, my state today has been mostly the same. And what's really important is to recognise that we need a more energetic energy state in order to shift um, uh, uh, our thought patterns and to make things happen. Um, so that's incredibly important as well. And I have a whole chapter 
about how to manage energy states because there are quite a few that we need to fill. Because what we've done a lot of is that we've got stuck into what I call a stress and recovery uh, cycle. Whereas actually, you know, we're too tired to do anything. Our lives are so demanding that we, um, we don't have the time or the space and we're too tired to do anything about changing our lives because number one, it takes thinking. Number two, we've got all the internal stuff going on inside us. But also number three, our culture is conspiring against us in a way. It's constantly conspiring to distract us. Um, and that is too easy to get hooked into because all of these lovely little machines that we surround ourselves with are hooked in to our, let's see that they're almost extensions of our nervous system. They're hooked into our dopamine and adrenaline systems and they play with them all the time if we don't do something about it. Um, the same way that our thoughts do the same thing as well, like ruminating is some of, there's a dopamine uh, um, uh, chasing that's going on there, you know, blaming people, or outrage is a lovely dopamine, let's go get it and feel kind of um, uh, sanctimonious, righteous outrage. Oh, that's a nice feedback loop right there. But that exhausts us all the time. So we also need to address that. The final thing, it's not the only thing, but one of the other, the final key piece of it is that we also need, and I work with clients, to identify those parts of themselves that they can speak back with courage, compassion, clarity, and wisdom, because those are there too. So let's give the brain, give the heart, give our sense of purpose some support. You know, if you take away the inner critics and the saboteurs or, or you minimize their effect, because I don't think you ever take them away. Um, let, and, and by the way, they can be allies as well. You know, if you keep them on the back seat rather than let them have a steering wheel. But actually having inner allies is the final piece that is really important to connect with those parts of yourself that are there for you, support you and are accessible to you at all times as well is incredibly important when you need to push against the internal and the external obstacles that will come up. 100%. That's, that's very, very wise, wise advice. Um, another thing that I noticed in the book, Fiona, is you talk about the importance of maybe changing our relationship with, with our mortality and with death. And, you know, how can this, how can this help, particularly with regard to, you know, this idea of maybe changing identities or moving getting on a different trajectory in life? The reason that I wanted to keep it in the book was that one of the things that we do as coaches is we try to help people shift perspective. And changing mm. energy state is one way to do that, you know. Um, but another way is to shift perspective to the end of our lives mm. because the reality of life is that it will one day end. And it's a reality that most of us, and again, our culture enables us with this brilliantly, uh, try to avoid for understandable reasons. You know, and philosophers have talked about this for years. It's, it's fear of suffering, fear of not being, um, the existential crisis of, well, what is life if it's ultimately, you know, four score years and 10, whatever it might be. Um, and we tend there are other, other cultures and other times in history where we've been much better at being reminded of that, especially when there was um, more disease, more war, people didn't expect to live so long. And perhaps at the same time, there was more of a faith in religion in a way, because one of the mm. things about religion, whether you're religious or not, religion has a way of helping you to feel a bit more at ease with mortality and death that's one of its aims if it was if we were going to give it a a, a, a a social um name it social psychological benefit it would be that mm. um, as well as community and connection and you know so it, it has a real purpose but without that what do we do and of course all day we're being pulled away from ideas of our own mortality so that denies us the perspective of the long term it denies us the perspective of the big picture. Um, 
that ultimately um, we are mortal. So what do we, that gives us the opportunity to use regret in a useful way as well, mm -hmm. right? It gives us the opportunity to say, ah, well, what am I going to regret? Not in the sense of seeing that life is a bucket list that you've got to tick off, but actually understanding what's ultimately really important. When I ask people to shift perspective to the end of their lives and imagine themselves as an old person looking back, and I ask them, what are your most treasured memories? What are you most proud of? Um, what did other people learn from you? That very often shifts their perspective entirely mm -hmm. out of the here and now and the worry about the to-do list or the what should I do with, you know, it, it changes that entirely and releases mm -hmm. some new and I think, um, uh, let's say, I call it bigger eye energy, mm. um, yeah. which knows more deeply what the picture of life is. But in all of our busy lives, we stay very much in the little eye, which is the, oh, I've got to go and you know, pick up my laundry and oh, I'm running out of milk and oh, I've got a social media update and oh, look what's happened in the war in Ukraine and all of these things that we're pulled into all the time and are pulled through us all the time but keep us in this little eye all the time never thinking about the big picture of how extraordinary life itself is even on a bad day and that you know there are days I've had days of true despair and anxiety um, and I will have days like that again but to know that just the just being able to feel the gift of aliveness itself, the gift of lifeness itself, is, is truly precious, no matter if it's not the best day you've ever had, um, and no matter if it's, if it's really difficult. And in doing that, when we see our lives as a gift, then it's like, ah, okay, it changes the perspective of oh, life is a chore, <laughs> life, is, life is a drag, you know, life is a party, life is a bitch it changes it completely to a gift. And ultimately, I think from that, we can also honor the gift of the lives of other, of other people in our lives and be, be a bit more compassionate and, and connected to our humanity with other people. Because as I sort of say in the book, we're all in the same boat. As Jim Morrison used to say, you know, no one here gets out alive. And we're <laughs> all, we're all, we all have to deal with that. We all, that is the... Uh, you know, I, I, Mike Trabandu, who was, you know, I used to go to the London Buddhist Centre a lot. Mike Trabandu was one of the teachers there, and he put it really well when he said, we have an extraordinary predicament. We know we're going to die, unlike any other animals, as far as we know. We don't really want to, and we don't know when it's going to happen. <laughs> so no wonder <laughs> we're anxious, you know. And that is, you know, for some philosophers, that was the source of our anxiety. So it's not really to change that, but actually to give us, to give people an idea of the compassion of the task of living itself and an idea mm. of the preciousness of the gift of it all, as well as that really, really good coaching perspective on what's really important. A hundred percent. Something I try and do like maybe like once a year is uh, there's a, there's an exercise and you've probably read this. Um, it's seven habits of highly effective people. Mm -hmm. by Stephen Covey and he gets you to visualize your own funeral and then imagine four speakers and basically them giving a talk about your life and what you were like as a person what you were like to be around or whatever mm -hmm. and anytime I do this like I it's exactly like you say you get access to that bigger bigger self energy and it feels like a really real it's hard to put into words but it's something like it just it does something to your your state where it completely changes your perspective. And yeah. the unfortunate one of the unfortunate things about being a human being is that it's almost like we have a bug in our in our brains where we're like we we're amazing at just not acknowledging the fact that we are going to die, you know. And because of that, we postpone a lot of important things in life. We take things for granted, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the real magic in life is found whenever you make a conscious effort to become conscious of the fact that 
you know, it's it's going to end. Um, and because of that, it's precious. And you've got to do the things that you really want to do and make the most of this experience, you know? Yeah, yeah. it's it's that's really beautiful. I, I love the eulogy piece. What would you want people to say about you? That's a, you know, really powerful. And I really resonate with what you're saying about the, the, the preciousness of it. I don't think it's, un, I think it's understandable that people don't really want to think about their mortality. Mm. Um, I don't think there are ways that a lot of people find that they can talk about it. You know, it's, it's, you, you, I use a story in, in the, the book of the Buddha who has a woman come to her, him who, who has just lost a child. And she says, that she's, I'm distraught. Buddha, please bring back my child. And the Buddha says, well, tell you what, why don't you go and find some white mustard seeds from a family that's never lost anybody? Bring them to me and we'll see what we can do. And off she goes and she comes back disconsolate because there's no family who hasn't lost, who hasn't experienced loss. And I think one of the difficulties is that in being understandably, un you know, in wanting to avoid the reality of death, it makes it quite difficult for us to connect with not just our losses, but other people's losses as well. Because mm -hmm. I think that, that grief is a really important part of life as well. You know, whether we want it to be or not, sometimes, and, and when, you know, Sometimes the work that we have to do in grief and the way that we can connect with people who are in loss and grieving is really important because then that's also how we share humanity with each other as well. Um, so there's so much to be missed of the richness of life. So it's not actually something negative at all. Um, it can be frightening. And when I say to people to, to be able to um, consider their mortality, um, that doesn't mean to say that we, we go, oh, I'm fine with it. And we erase or we avoid lots of very difficult feelings about it. Um, because those things are really rich and true and are there to be experienced as well. Definitely, definitely. Um, what is it? It's Irvin Yalom, the psychotherapist. He says the physicality of death will destroy us the idea of death will, will save us something like that there um anyway um the, in the book you talk about fiona um this idea of the importance of separating from scripts maybe scripts that no longer serve us you know um mm -hmm. can you maybe tell us ab about that there and how people if they're aware they're so sort of like they're they're running on past scripts from maybe conditioning from a young age how can they maybe separate from those and then maybe develop more empowering scripts like how would you help someone do that the way that i suggest people do it is an exercise that's been around for a very long time and it's like sometimes writing stuff or saying stuff is really easy so it's one of these things you say the first thing that comes up so if i say at weekends i should at my age i should with my children i should you basically go hunting for the shoulds it's remarkable it Sometimes I say with, with English people, try and going through a day without saying sorry. And that's an amazing oh. mindfulness exercise because it's nobody in England lasts <laughs> 20 minutes, right? Um, but do the same things with shoulds, the internal shoulds. Oh, I should be doing this. Write it down and look at it and say, is that, is that a should? I mean, there are some things that I should do. You know, I should shower. I should call my dad on his birthday. I should eat, you know. Um, I shouldn't have that last piece of dessert because I've already had two slices or what have you. Um, but there are other shoulds that are core beliefs around, for instance, what you should be doing at your age, how much money you should be earning, whether you should be married or not, the kind of lifestyle you should be having. Um, as a coach, I don't need to go into where they came from with people because that is the work of therapy. Um, very often mm. they're from childhood, but also they're from culture. We absorb them from culture. You should be this weight. You should look like this. Um, here's a filter to help you. We have, we have a solution. It's only going to cost you $14.99. Um, but um, so that's the first thing to do, to notice the scripts. 
The second thing is to accept them. We all have them. And what I mean by accept is don't beat yourself up, right? These, these have come into your life for a reason, sometimes to keep, again, to keep you safe, um, to make you feel that you belong. They might be the things that your parents might have said to you or a teacher might have said to you, what your culture says. So don't beat yourself up for that. But ask yourself, is that true? Is that what I want? Mm. You know, um, that, that, that's what can really sort of start to help to separate, to separate them a little bit. Um, track as well what is underlying some of your current, you know, what some of your core beliefs are. So we all have core beliefs as well. And you might be able to spot some of them and they might not show up as shoulds, but they might show up like this. Nobody dates anyone or wants to hire anyone over 40. Mm. Oh, really? That's a fact? Or is that actually a script? Um, mm. uh, nice guys come last. Is that a fact or is that a script? And we mm. don't even, we actually operate off these quite a lot without even realizing. Couples are brilliant at it. They will always state facts that actually are feelings, you know, um, you know, it's wrong. You're wrong to do that rather than saying, well, is that true? Or is it just that I feel uncomfortable around this? So to spot those scripts, to spot those core beliefs, to notice them, to accept them, but then also to choose what would be more useful. Is that true? Is that true? A hundred percent of the time, you know, what is it that I want and what is it that might be a bit more useful? to me mm. but also to make sure that that rings true as well so you know to give you the story that comes out of my own life and you know as i said i'd always i didn't realize that i was operating my life from a fear of abandonment i just didn't mm. know and i was also operating my life from a belief that i was fundamentally unlovable because my mother had left me when i was young i didn't even know that that was going on but it was showing up everywhere nobody wants me because you know, here's an excuse why I can't do this. Here's an excuse why it will never work. I was also self-sabotaging myself in some ways. I was also putting on a show. People only love me because I'm funny or intelligent. Um, or, you know, as long as I'm, and as long as I'm funny and intelligent in the life of the party and, you know, that's okay. But what about the not shiny side? Well, I can't show that. I can't show that. I have to just show you know, the, um, as I call it, the shiny surfaces. So guess what? You know, I had, um, I had a shiny life, but not a life that was ultimately whole and full. And the interesting thing is the feedback that I've got, not just in my life, because I now do much more of the work that I love and that I'm aligned with and that um, is aligned with my values and purpose. But also a lot of my friends will say that I'm now much more available to them as a person. You know, I'm much more honest with them about what I really feel. I don't people please so much anymore. Um, there's a sense of really getting to know me and seeing me, not just as this shiny, happy person, you know, shiny, successful person, but as, um, if you like, which is one part of me, not the real, not, not the unreal part, but they get to see all of it. So they can connect with all of that and feel that our relationships and our friendships are more stable and satisfying and nurturing. Um, and that is really meaningful in my life. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I just think that <clears throat> that ability to show up as, you know, a, a full human being and not just this, this perfect image of ourselves is so, so underrated, you know? Um, yeah. Now, for just before we wrap up, Fiona, for anybody that's listening to this that has that sense that maybe they're out of alignment, um, maybe they're not not on their path at the moment, uh, but they, they want to sort of start moving in that direction, apart from buying the book, which I definitely recommend, um, what are what are some practical like what what like would be a small first step that would get them on their trajectory to um to this more meaningful existence, would you say? I would say, understand what your values are. Hmm. A lot of the things we try to align with our lives are things that we think might energize us. Like, oh, if I move to the country, 
it, that'll energize me if I change jobs or get a new partner. Um, but the truth is that when we talk about alignment, it doesn't mean that we align with the world. It means that, that's, that, that we find a path in the world that aligns with who we are at heart. Mm. So you have to have a compass, your compass, your GPS, to know, you know, we can feel when, when we're out of alignment, but what the hell do we do about it? So I always say to people to do a little bit of work on understanding what your values are. And there are some tips to this. Don't pick them off a list. Because what we do then, of course, is we put all the things in there that we think think sound great. The question that I always ask people, and um, it's as simple as this, you know, think of times when you feel really alive, mm. you know, or maybe that, that um, when you think about the purpose piece, you know, going back, what do you want people to say? I love, I love that you brought that in. What do you want people to say about you? What, what will be in your eulogy? Will it be, oh, well, you know, he was marvelous at Fortnite. Or do, or do you say, um, you know what, when I was feeling bad, that person came and sat with me. They were mm. really kind and they were consistent and they were inspiring. They persevered. They, you know, were loving. They, you know, just showed me this, whatever. When you answer that question, what is it? When do I feel most alive? Like what really just, wow, I could do, you know, I really could do all day or it would just be so not joyful because alive can also mean at a time of stress, you know, you have to take charge and get on with stuff. Then ask the question, what was it about that that made you feel alive? Was it because you were being creative? Was it because you were taking leadership? Was it because you were um, trying to bring everybody else with you? You know, no man left behind. Um, hmm. Whatever it was, that starts to build your compass. And when you know what your core values are, not the aspired ones, not the, you know, then you have much more of a sense of your, you know, you can't find a path without a compass and that'll be your compass. So that is absolutely what I would say, one of the first things to look at. And it may well surprise you in some ways. That's brilliant. And just, I think it's very important what you mentioned there at the end about distinguishing between your core values and the aspirational ones. Could you maybe tell us how we can best do that too? Yeah. D doing the exercise about, um, like if you, if I asked you now um, to write, if, if you think back on the last 12 months or the last year and you say, okay, what were the things that I'm really proud of that I read the times when I really felt alive, um, think, harness it in actual lived experience mm. rather than, taking stuff off a list or even doing one of those, you know, sometimes you go online and, you know, somewhere down a rabbit hole, you get one of those quizzes that says, are you a person who likes, you know, cats or dogs? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not as simple as that, but you have two choices and you go, Ooh, uh, this, ah, oh, and it mashes the numbers and it, it, it turns out that you're, you know, you should be working in engineering or something like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and by the way, this isn't about a job title, right? But when you start with your lived experience, when you lean in, then rather than telling your life what values you should have, then you listen to your life and let your life tell you what matters to you. And that's really crucial. 100%. It's like that Par Parker Palmer book, Let Your Life Speak. Oh, yeah, yeah, total hero. Um, and, and, you know, he is in his 80s and still doing talks and seminars. And I went to one only a couple of months ago that was so meaningful to me because I said, you know, how do we deal with all, all of the stress of life and getting older and looking after elderly parents and thinking about death and, you know, and, you know, I was expecting this. And you know what? He gave me the simplest wisdom of all. He said, I think we just need to cut ourselves some slack. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it's that too, right? This isn't, don't make this a job to find an outcome. Make it a way that you can dance your dance. 100%. That's a great note to end on. I have to commend you in that um, impersonation of Parker Palmer. That's <laughs> it's actually very good. It's, it's just a general impersonation of <laughs> like American Midwest man. <laughs> um, so is there anywhere specific you'd recommend people to pick up the book, Fiona? Um, like a website or Amazon or where, where would you say? Um, Amazon, Amazon um, 
all sort of good bookshops. Um, there are also, if, you know, I we're starting to get rights sold for translation as well. So if it's not, if you're, you know, people are listening and they prefer to read it in their own language, it looks very likely at, at least that it's coming out in a couple more languages later on this year, which is fantastic. One of which is Arabic. The other one isn't confirmed yet. So I'll let you know. Um, but yeah, any good bookshop. And it's also going to be available on ebook and on audiobook as well. So Audible is always just, I mean, it's a great um, facility that. So people will be able to find it there too, if they can listen to my voice some more. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, and the website, FionaBufflinCoaching.com? That's right. Yeah. And I would just say, just to, before we end, um, honestly, just from my own sort of lived experience, I think the difference between living in alignment and living out of alignment is night and day. It's a different experience of being a human being, you know, and this book, book you've written is essentially a step-by-step -step guidebook to, to creating that in your life. You know, so it's so, so valuable. I highly recommend picking it up and actually doing the exercises in it. So I want to commend you on writing it, Fiona. I want to wish you the best of luck with the, the launch and everything. Um, and I just hope it, it gets out there, you know. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support as well. It means a lot. It's great to talk to you again.